because some believe that you can leave the truth and go into something else and still be considered in the truth. Well, Jesus said, I am the way, I am the what? Truth, and I am the what? Life. So how many Jesuses are there? There's only one. If there's only one Jesus, then there's only one truth. And this is what we want to talk about tonight because it seems to be a spirit of error that is proliferating through uh, the religious community in this city particularly. I don't want you to think that it's just in this city, um, but it is going on uh, in all other places that people think it's all right to leave the faith. Well, we need to examine what the scriptures have to say about it. And when we look at what the scriptures have to say about it, it is simply what God has to say about it. Now, some people say, well, uh, you don't know their hearts as to why they left. Well, yes, we do, because the scripture talks about an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Anyone that leaves the truth has an evil heart. Uh, and that's, and, and of course, um, they, people say, well, uh, you, don't, you don't know their heart. Well, that's true. We don't know their heart. They don't know their heart. And the fact that they don't know their heart is that they do what is in error and think that they are doing what's right because they don't know their heart. God spoke through Jeremiah in the seventh chapter of Jeremiah and said the heart is deceitful and above all things desperately wicked. Now, how, hard, how deceitful is the heart? The heart is so deceitful that it will convince you that what you're doing is right when it is wrong. What example do we have? Eve in the Garden of Eden. It was her heart as influenced by the devil that led her astray. And so this is what we want to talk about tonight. So let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 because we have to establish what the Word of God has to say uh, concerning these matters. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 and verse number 1 through 3. Now, what we should realize is that the scriptures must be fulfilled. They must be fulfilled. For every scripture in the Bible, and there's 31,173 scriptures, verses of scriptures in the Bible, 31,173 verses, each and every one of them must be fulfilled because the scriptures were written by holy men of God as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. And so God spoke to them things that were going to happen into the future. And what he told them was going to happen in the future, they wrote about it. And uh, these things have to happen because God has already seen it happen. You see, the scripture says in Isaiah 46 and 10, the scripture says he's declared the end from what? The beginning. God knows what the end is going to be. From the beginning, he has already seen the end of all things and everything in between from the beginning to the end. And so the scriptures then in prophecy are written based upon what God has already seen happen. And he inspires his ministers, uh, his prophets, his apostles in the scriptures to tell them what things are going to happen in the future and they write about them, and they happen. And so this is what we should realize. The scriptures cannot be broken. They cannot be broken because God has already seen everything that's going to happen and has written in the scriptures based upon what he has seen in his foreknowledge, in his foreknowledge. And so keep in mind then that there are some good scriptures to fulfill, and there are some bad scriptures to fulfill. Uh, but nonetheless, everyone is going to fulfill some part of the scripture. It is up to us to determine which part of the scripture we're going to fulfill. Of course, there's one scripture where it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, the Lord shall descend from heaven with a shout, voice of the archangel, the trump of God, dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain uh, shall be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so shall we ever be with the Lord. That scripture is going to be fulfilled because God has already seen it happen in his foreknowledge. 
Then there's another scripture where it says, Depart from me, ye curse into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And they were all cast into the lake, which burneth with fire and brimstone. Now that has to happen because God's seen it. Already happened. And he gave the revelation to John on the island of Patmos and showed John those things that were going to happen that God knew before the foundation of the world. Now the question is, what scripture are we going to fulfill? Because we're going to fulfill one or the other. One of the other we're going to fulfill. And it doesn't matter who doesn't believe in it. It doesn't matter who has, has an excuse as to um, uh, uh, why they fulfill the bad part. It doesn't matter. It's not based on their heart. It's not based on their decision. We have to, uh, we're going to fulfill either one or the other. And that is simply because God has already seen it happen. And what God has seen in his foreknowledge has to happen. It cannot go contrary to what he has already seen and what he has already declared that will happen. You see, the things that are written in the scripture is what God has declared. And if God has declared it, then that's it, you see. And it has nothing to do with what we think or what we believe. The Bible says, what if some did not believe? Shall the unbelief make the faith of God or what God has said? of none effect, God forbid. He said, yea, let God be true, but every man a what? A liar. In the, in the Amplified Version, it says, let every man be false, because what God has declared is going to happen. So we're going to look at some of these things, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to deal with verse number 1 through 3. Let's read verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, our gathering together unto him is the rapture, is what he's talking about, the rapture. Verse 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. Now notice he said that you don't be, well, shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. And of course, that is the rapture. Of course, he could come at any time. All right? And based on how we live, we'll determine which scripture we fulfill that God has declared that some will fulfill. Verse number three. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the what? That's the scripture we're dealing with, the falling away, the falling away. Now, when Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, uh, how many souls were added to the church? 3,000 souls. That one preacher said he preached so good he didn't even make an altar call. Folk just came up and said, men and brother, what shall we do? And he said, repent, be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ, Mr. Sin, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And the Bible says later on, 3,000 souls were added. Well, in the fourth chapter, Peter preached again, and uh, he didn't even make an altar call. 5,000 got saved. So they were getting saved in great numbers during the days of the apostles. And of course, two years later, around two years later, the apostle Paul got saved, uh, a persecutor of the church. And this was a great shock because he had caused many to blaspheme. He hated the name Jesus until the Lord stepped in and told Ananias that he is a chosen vessel unto me. And so God uh, converted him, he got saved, and uh, he started preaching, and many people began to be added to the church. And so for decades, many people were getting saved. The church was being persecuted, but people were coming in, going down in Jesus' name in great droves. They were spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the then-known world. The Philip witnessed to the Ethiopian eunuch. And the Ethiopian eunuch got saved, went back to Ethiopia. And if you check your history, uh, the great revival broke out in Ethiopia. And then Thomas 
took the gospel over to what was known as what is known as India today. Great revival broke out over there. They preached the gospel throughout the then known world. But as Paul got older and began to realize, God began to give him some insight into what's going to happen in the future. That all of these that are getting saved, left and right, all over, even in Caesar's household. Paul said on one occasion, greet those that are saved in Caesar's household. And Caesar was, Roman, uh, was head of the Roman Empire. Even some got saved in his household. But God showed Paul some things that were going to happen in the last days. In other words, it's not always going to be like this. There's going to come a great falling away. He says the Lord's going to come, but before he comes, there's going to be a great falling away. Now, you all that have been members of this church from decades, and some of you even uh, since you were children, or perhaps born in this church, during the years of Dr. Foree, the church bloomed. But as time went on, you saw the fulfillment of the scripture. The great what? Falling away. What you saw is what we have been seeing throughout the churches of God over the years. People coming into the church, remaining for a while, and then leaving the church. Whether they go back out into the world. Now, this is what we're talking about. When I talk about leaving an apostolic church and going to another apostolic church, we're talking about what the Bible says falling away. Falling away. Now, in Ephesians 4 and 5, it says there's one Lord, one faith, one what? Baptism. One Lord, which means there's one God, one faith, which is the apostolic faith, faith established by the apostles. That is the only faith. Now, there's over 3,000 faiths in the world today, over 3,000 different religions. But the Bible says only one faith, which means there's only one that God recognizes. God only recognizes the faith that he established, handed down to the apostles that became known today as the apostolic or apostolic faith. That is the only faith that God recognizes. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 16, upon this rock, I will build what? My church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. How many churches do you think Jesus is building? He said, my church. Can we say amen? And he's building his church with the souls of men. So unless it is of the apostolic faith, which is what he established and handed over to his apostles, it is not a faith that God is recognizing. Now, we put a whole lot of, on sincerity. And sincerity has its place, but you have to have more than sincerity. I can get on I-65 south and say I'm going to Indianapolis. Just as sincere as I want to be. Might even pray before I got in the car. You think I'm going to wind up there? No, I'm sincere. Can you say amen? <laughs> Just as sincere and honest and might even be playing some gospel music in the, in the car. But will I get there? You know why? I'm going in the what? Wrong direction. That's why the scripture says sincerity and truth. Sincerity and truth. You can't have sincerity and not truth. And you can't have truth without sincerity. There's a reason why God put them both together, because they are like brothers and sisters. They go hand in hand. Sincerity and truth. There's only one truth. There's only one church. Now in the 17th chapter of the book of Revelation, it talks about the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. Babylon the great. The reason why the false church is called Babylon is because their first prophet was Nimrod, the builder of Babylon, which rests today near the land of Baghdad today. If you look upon your map, you will see it there. 
where the Tower of Babel was. That was the beginning of false doctrine. That's why God, see, God always deals with the roots of situations. And that's why when he looked, when John, the Bible said, he, when he saw the great whore sitting upon many waters, the Bible says he wondered what great wonderment or amazement because it was a woman that he had never seen before. You know who that was? That was the false church, the Catholic church. And all of those that have come out from her, is part of the great horde. And of course, in Revelation chapter 17, it says the great horde that sits upon many waters. Waters in prophecy has to do with peoples. So it is the false church that is upheld and supported by not God, but the waters, the people. And see, understand then that the false church is any church that embraces the Trinity. Because any church that says that Jesus is not the Father, your Bible says is antichrist. It's antichrist. And see, um, <laughs> see, I don't know, um, well, I'll leave that alone. Antichrist, can we say amen? Any faith that denounces that Jesus is the Father, that he is God that has come into the flesh, is antichrist. Christ, because the foundation of the church is on who Jesus is. So if you have a true church, you have to have a what? False church. You can't have a false true church. Just like you can't have a true false church. There's either the true church or there's what? The false church. And that's why the apostolic church is the only church that did not come from the whore. <laughs> the scripture calls her a whore and calls her daughters harlots. And we teach, I taught on the false church. I think it's online somewhere. We got almost 700 videos of Bible classes online. Uh, we, went, uh, we went to Wild Eggs today because my son loves Wild Eggs. And a woman said, do I know you? You look familiar. I said, I ain't from around here. I said, I got about 700 videos on YouTube. She said, well, maybe that's where I saw you. <laughs> And she didn't give us no deal on the dinner. But anyway, I didn't, I, I didn't press for it, though. I did get some extra potatoes. Hallelujah. And I ain't even supposed to be eating potatoes. But um, this is what the scripture says. And, of course, that's why Nimrod is mentioned. And, of course, according to history, Nimrod was supposed to be a black man. You know, you know, you know you, you, the, the folk like to make all the good people black in the Bible and all the, the bad people white, and then some of the white folk like to make all the good people white in the Bible, and, and all the bad people black. I don't know what they do with Solomon. <laughs> Solomon said, I'm black. He said, the sun has darkened me. So he was a black man. David wasn't a black man, because if he was, the Bible would have said he was black. The scripture said Moses was married to an Ethiopian woman, so Moses wasn't black. What does it matter? Absolutely nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. So understand then, um, there's the true church and there is the false church. It's not that way because Bishop Johnson said it is, it's that way because the Bible says it is. But the question is, do we believe the word of God or are we all wrapped up in our feelings? We got to keep in mind that our feelings are not saved now. Did God save your feelings? No. Because feelings is part of the flesh. That's why we have to keep the feelings under the control of the baptism of what? Holy Ghost. Holy Ghost. Because our feelings are not saved. Can we say amen? All right. So um, the great falling away. So you have witnessed that. And I got news for you. It's going to keep on happening. You know why? Because God said it was what? And we can't stop it. The only thing we can do is teach you and let you know what's going on so that you will have the ability to watch and look up for your redemption does what? Draweth not. All right. So, um, 1 Timothy chapter 4. We wasn't going to look at some other scriptures, but we don't have time for that because we want to let you out at a good time. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 1 through 3. See, Paul understood how folk was getting saved 
But God in prophecy dropped some things in his heart. And he wrote to us, said, now the Lord is coming. But before he comes, there's going to be a great falling away. And again, we are dealing with the falling away from those that leave truth and go to the false church. Can we say amen? Because there is a false church. Are you listening to me? <laughs> All right. First Timothy chapter 4, verse number 1. Let's read. Now the Spirit is speaking expressly. Hold it right there. This is an express message from the Holy Ghost to us. Paul's writing to Timothy now. Timothy is a bishop. And he's letting him know now, Timothy, this is a message from the Holy Ghost. This is not a message from Pastor Johnson. This is from what? And notice that spirit is capitalized. Is that right? Now the spirit, or in other words, God is a spirit. Now God says, let's read on, that in the what? Now what times are we in? Are we in the latter times? The uh, Hebrews chapter number one, the first few verses there, lets you know that the last days began when Jesus came to the earth. That's when officially the last days began. Why when that was 2,000 years ago? Because it was God's last efforts to save man and to have a church for himself. The last days. And so now we are in the latter times. In the latter times. And this is what he saw. It wasn't happening in his day, but he says the Holy Ghost is saying this is what's going to happen in what? The latter times. That we are in those times. That in the latter times, let's read. Some shall what? Not all, but what? Some shall depart from what? Now you can't depart unless you first of all have been what? Part. You can't depart and still be part. Can you say amen? Just like you cannot come into the sanctuary and depart out of the sanctuary and say you're still in the sanctuary. We're going to call you a doctor if you're still saying that because you're not in here. So the same rule applies. Depart. Unless depart means something else. I mean, what else does depart mean? Do we have our own definition of depart? Do we have uh, Luther's dictionary of biblical words that we have a different def definition? No. Depart. This is the Holy Ghost speaking in prophecy to the Apostle Paul, letting us know what's going to happen in our time. And we are in that time. Some shall depart from the faith. Now, if they departed from the faith, they've left the faith. You can't depart and still be part of it. Well, my heart it has nothing to do with your heart. If you want to say it has something to do with your heart, it means that you left in your heart first. Then your body left. Can we say amen? <laughs> so if you want to say it was based on that heart, I agree with you. Because the departing starts in the heart first. Then the action takes forth. See, the scripture says, when lust hath conceived, then it brings forth what? Sin. That is, if the lust is in your mind, all right, when you put in practice what is in your mind, then that's when the person has sinned. Because there's a whole lot of folk in our churches that have departed from the faith and they're still sitting up in church. Oh, yes. We say amen. <laughs> oh, yeah. You can ask Moses about that. Moses knew all about that. Praise the Lord. We know about it today. Depart from the faith. Now, if they departed from the faith, that means then they, they, they stop listening to what the faith teaches them. Because if they took, kept heed and took heed to it, it would keep them. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not what? Sin against you. So they stopped listening. See, you think about Eve. Eve stop listening to God and start listening to something else. A seducing spirit. Well, let's read. Depart from the faith, giving heed to what? Seducing spirits and doctrines of the devil. A seducing spirit is a spirit that comes to bring you something that you are inclined to believe. Because the devil knows what type of lie that will get us. He knows. The devil knows what kind of a lie 
that we are prone to fall for. And that's how he seduces. If he has to come to you in a religious manner, then if that is a way that it is prone to get you where he wants you to be, he will do that. He knows how to tell the right kind of lie. How is that? Because he's the father of lies. Can we say amen? If there's anybody that can lie, Father Satan can lie. Are you listening to what I'm saying? He's the father of lies. And so when God has said, I will give you what? Pastors according to my heart, which shall feed you with what? But I'm saying I don't need a pastor. Even though God said I'm going to give you one, I don't need that God. I can do it on my own. That is the father of what? It has to be. Because why would God save me through the preaching of a pastor and puts in a pastor to take me on to perfection and all of a sudden I get in my mind, I don't need that. You know what happened? I've been seduced. I mean, it's not the Holy Ghost. Jesus said, when, well, first of all, the, 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 the scribes and Pharisees, when they saw him casting out devils, they said, oh, he casts out devils by the prince of devils. He said, Jesus said, how can I do that? Is Satan divided against himself? Satan has enough sense to realize that his demons have got to be with him. If Satan is divided against himself, his kingdom will not stand. Now, the devil knows that. Don't you think God knows that too? So you think God's going to tell me, tell you something that is contrary to this? No, he's not going to do that. That's not him. Unless a person has been rebellious and refused to repent and then God will take his hands off and give them a strong delusion to believe a lie. And if he gives them a strong delusion to, be, to believe a lie, there's nothing nobody can do to help them. They are lost. They have become reprobate. And that's what we are dealing with today in the church. Well, he says, give me heed to what? Seducing spirits and what? Doctrines of devil. Teachings that are inspired by the devil. All right. Notice it says, depart from the faith, giving what? Heed to. They're listening to the wrong spirit. They stop listening to the Holy Spirit and they're listening to what? The seducing spirit. And the seducing spirit is causing them to depart from the faith. What faith? The faith that was once delivered unto who? The saints. Can we say amen? Well, let's speak verse number two. Let's re read verse number two. Let's read. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience here with a what? They have no conscience whatsoever about what they say and what they do. In most cases, it's because God has given them a strong delusion. And of course, he is doing that. He will do that because he had already seen it happen. And he's just speaking it by the mouth of his apostles as to what's going to happen. And it is happening right now. We all know folk that have been baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. And you try to tell them about truth and they will not hear anything of it. And you look at them and you just can't believe what has happened to them. There's one scripture says, it is as though that they have forgotten that they were once saved. In most cases, it's because they've gotten a strong delusion. The script, what you are seeing, you're seeing the scriptures being fulfilled. That's what you're seeing. All right. Um, let's read verse 3. Forbidding to marry, commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created, to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know what? Know the truth. Can we say amen? St. John chapter 10. Verse 22 through 28. See, the, the Lord spoke to Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 58, verse number one. He said to Isaiah, cry loud, spare not, lift up your voice as a trumpet. And show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. But many ministers are not doing it because some of them are afraid to do it. Some of them are, they're afraid of losing people. 
But see, when you understand what the scripture says, you're going to lose people because the scripture has already prophesied that many will not endure. What kind of doctrine? It's not doctrine. See, so when you understand what the scriptures are saying, it helps you. Uh, it helps me because I know what's going on. If I'm teaching truth and folks start leaving, I know what's going on because the word of God is only two responses to the word of God. You either receive it or you reject it. It either draws you to God or it does what? It drives you away. And when you understand the scriptures, see, and this is what I'm trying to get you to do uh, through the scriptures, to understand and see what's going on. If you understand and see what's going on through the scriptures, then you are now looking through the eyes of Jesus Christ and not through your own eyes. Because every man is right in his what? Oh, but when you look through the eyes of God, God is right. Can we say amen? And when you view things based on the scripture, you are looking through the eyes of God because you are looking through what his word has said. And when you do that, it helps you. It helps me. That's why I'm able to withstand so much criticism and still smile. I bought some new toothpaste. I'm trying to get my teeth whiter so that when I smile, it'll just sparkle on television. <laughs> I talk too much, don't I? Well... St. <laughs> John chapter 10. I'm having a good time being saved. How about you? I ain't depressed at all. <laughs> depressed about what? I mean, you know, yeah, I got a lot of problems, but, you know, we always going to have problems, aren't we? You might have problems because you ain't got no problems. I ain't got no problem. I'm worried about that. Isn't that <laughs> Did you ever wear everything going good? You get to look around and say, hold on now, what, what, what's, what's about to happen? Don't do that. Just enjoy. The bottom will fall out soon enough. Just enjoy what you got. <laughs> All right. St. John chapter 10, verse 22. Let's read. And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was what? When is everybody there? Verse 23. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch, then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us doubt if thou be the Christ? What? Now he already told them in the 8th chapter, but uh, they didn't understand it because they were blinded. Verse number 25. Jesus answered them, I told you and you believe not. See, I told you. He told them, didn't he? Sometimes folk ask me a question in Bible class. I'm like, we already covered that. <laughs> Well, I thought we already covered that. Well, they're just like the scribes and Pharisees. Jesus said, I told you. But what's the problem? They don't what? They don't believe. Well, tell me again. What am I going to tell you again for? You still ain't going to believe it. I told you and you believe not. Let's read. Works that I do in my Father's name, they what? And I can say that. The works that are done through my ministry here uh, bear witness that God is with me. Look at all the stuff the Lord bless us to do. Can we say amen? amen? And we're not finished yet. We're going higher. We ain't going down. We're going what? We're going higher. I ain't going down. There might be some folk going down, but when they go down, I'm just, well, he's down, and I'm going up. Praise the Lord. All right, but anyway. Um, verse 26. But ye believe not. Notice he says, the works that I do in my Father's name, they prove who I am. But ye, what? Believe not. Why is it that they don't believe? Let's read. Because you are not of my sheep, as I said, what? Now, keep in mind, they were Jews. And they were supposed to be the children of God. They were the seed of Abraham. They were the children of God by birth. But Jesus is God. Is that right? And Jesus said, you are not one of my sheep. Why? Because all that I'm doing demonstrates who I am and you can't see it because you don't believe it. This is the reason why you're not none of mine in the first place. Now that's the same principle applies in the church. Because you think about it. The Jews were God's people. Is that right? They were the Bible says what advantage then hath the Jew? He says much every way because the oracles and the laws were given to them. They had the prophets. They had the Ten Commandments. They had the tabernacle. They had everything. And yet here they are can't even believe who Jesus is 
He says, you are not one of my sheep. And the same thing applies in the church. A person can be baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues, shouting, and all this other kind of stuff. But if they do not believe in the teachers of the word of God, they are none of his sheep. The same principle applies. That's why we have it here. Now, this was Israel without the Holy Ghost. How much more are those that have the Holy Ghost? All right. So, um, but ye believe not because ye are not what? Uh, my sheep. You have folk in the church that won't get with the program, that won't submit, that won't be obedient, that are causing trouble. In most cases, it's because they are really not one of God's sheep. That's just the bottom line. <laughs> I mean, it cuts it close, doesn't it? Well, um, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Verse 27. My sheep do what? Hear my voice. Notice he said, he placed emphasis, my. That means that there are some sheep that are his, and there's some sheep that are just not. All right. My sheep do what? Hear my voice. And I what? Know them and what? Now, how are you following Jesus today? He's not down here in the flesh. Paul said, follow, he told the Corinthian church, follow me as I what? Follow Christ. So you follow Jesus as you follow the pastor. As the pastor follows Jesus. You can't follow Jesus and not follow the pastor. Can we say amen? Just like you can't follow God without following Jesus. That's the whole, the whole premise is what he's saying. You're saying you're the children of God, but you're trying to kill me. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? <laughs> oh, I feel my help tonight. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall what? Never perish, neither shall any man pluck them where? Now notice he said, mine, those that are not his will be plucked out. Those that are not his will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits. They give heed to seducing spirits because they are not of his sheep. Because the scripture has already said there has to be a falling what? Away. But don't let that be you. Can we say Amen. See, like we said, the enemy knows how to come and uh, tell you the right kind of lie. And I've told you all the time, and I've seen it for the last 38 years I've been saved. When the devil gets to the saint, first of all, he turns him or her against the pastor. The very one that God has given to them to help them to be saved because they can't save themselves. Isn't that something? I'm telling you. <laughs> All right, well, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13 through 17. Or they try to, the enemy tries to turn you against your brother and your sister. That's why Jesus said in 18 chapter Matthew, if you had an order against your brother and sister, you need to go talk to him. I'm going to go pray. He didn't say go pray. Is that right? See, we think prayers answer everything. Prayer is not to answer to everything. Some things you just have to do. Amen. Just like praise ain't to answer to everything. I'm going to praise the Lord and get everything the devil stole from me. The devil ain't stole nothing from me. <laughs> I don't get it. The Bible says there's a time to get and there's a time what? You ain't never read that in Ecclesiastes chapter 3? There's a time to get and a time to what? How, did, how is the devil going to steal anything from you if God let it go? That's like saying the devil stole my son away from me. The devil didn't steal my son away from me. God took him because it was his time. I never understood how the devil can actually steal anything from you. You think the devil is concerned about my car, your house, your job? The only thing that Satan comes to steal is salvation. That's the only thing. Maybe God allowed that car to be taken back because you used the tires to get it. <laughs> Maybe the God allowed the car to be taken because you wouldn't let your wife drive it. Take the bus. I knew one preacher that had a car 
and his, and his wife had to walk to work 3.30 in the morning. <laughs> oh, everybody not one of God's sheep. Is that right? This was a preacher. Dear sister, walking, walking to work in the winter time. And the husband laying up in the bed asleep. Like the cartoons, you see all the Z's and, and above his head, he just and supposed to be saved. I know him personally. Well, somebody said, what's his name? I'm not going to call his name. <laughs> I'm not going to call his name. <laughs> well, yeah, that's true. And, and, sleep, and sleep real good at night. Something wrong somewhere. Is that right? You do your spouse like that and you can still sleep at night? Lord have mercy. So I get a feeling some of y'all don't believe some of these stories I tell you, but they're true. <laughs> I'm not up here making stuff up. One time, uh, uh, he, you know, uh, she had to ride the van home while he drove his car home. And I remember one time, his wife came up to him, and he said, get your raggedy mouth out my face, because she had, had, had no teeth. And then my wife was pregnant, and he said, oh, baby, let me help you across the street. I said, Lord, don't let the car run him over, because my wife is out there with him. <laughs> Post be saved. Isn't that something? All right, let's move on, because y'all don't believe none of these stories. I tell y'all anyway. <laughs> All right, let's pick it up, verse 13. Let's read. Well, let's start. Yeah, let's read verse 13. Let's read. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and what? Now, this was written almost 2,000 years ago. And if Paul said it's going to get worse, again, he's speaking in prophecies. Is that right? Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Now, if it was to wax worse and worse, and had 2,000 years up until our time to wax worse and worse and worse. Must be pretty bad by now, huh? Oh, yeah, it's pretty bad by now to where you have preachers that are gay and come sit right up in the pulpit and cross their legs in the pulpit. And then we're supposed to support them. Not me, because I know what the Bible teaches. I have to preach on them. I have to cry loud. Can we say amen? <laughs> oh, yeah, because that's not God. That's the devil. The devil just came in the pulpit and crossed his legs and said, hi. <laughs> not in this church. That's all I can say. Not in this church. You ain't getting on our musical instruments. You ain't getting in our choir. Uh, you sit out there uh, and uh, repent. Can we say amen? amen. We're not going to call you out and embarrass you and belittle you or anything like that. Uh, but you, you're not, uh-uh. It, it, it ain't happening up in here. It ain't happening up in here, sugar. <laughs> All right. Well, let's read on. Evil men seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Since this is going to happen, what does he tell us to do? Verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. This is the Apostle Paul. What we have taught you as apostles, because this is the apostolic faith, don't leave them, don't depart from them, do what? Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast what? Been assured of what you know has proven that is right. Let's read. Knowing of whom thou hast what? Learn them. You continue in the things that you have been taught. Continue in the things of Bishop Schultz, Dr. Foree, Bishop Stewart, the present pastor. Continue in those things, knowing uh, of whom thou hast learned them. This is what he's telling Timothy. He's encouraging Timothy to do this. And Timothy is a bishop. And so if he can encourage Timothy to do this, how about you and I? Verse 15. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee what? Wise unto salvation through faith, which is in who? So if God has ordained the scriptures to, be for, uh, to give you wisdom and to bring salvation to you, why would he tell you something other than what the scriptures say then? Why would he do that? That's not the spirit of God. That's the spirit of error. Because the Holy Scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. If we take heed to it, if we live it. 
So God will never tell us anything contrary to his word because his word is designed to make us wise unto salvation. Can we say amen? Verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It means it comes from the breath of God and is profitable for what? Doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in what? Let's use the word correction. The scriptures are designed to correct. Now, if they're going to correct, that means someone has to be in error. See, the word of God has got to be against you first before it can be for you. Did you know that? It's given for correction. That's why when we deal with matters, we sit down with the Bible. We don't sit down with Joyce Meyer's book, Me and My Big Mouth. You know she got a book out, Me and My Big Mouth? I'm not saying you can't read her book. You know, you got Benny Hinn books and Creflo Dollar books. You know, I'm not knocking any of that at all. I don't read them. But, you know, just make sure they're not telling you anything different than the faith. Can you say amen? You know, because people think that God talks directly to them. The spirit told me. Really? What spirit? God talks directly to the pastor. He deals with his people through the Holy Ghost, but he talks directly to the pastor. God does not talk to the congregation like he talks to the pastor. We have all, we have five books of examples of that in the Old Testament. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. How God commanded Moses and Moses in turn commanded who? The people. So God was talking to the people through who? Moses. Now, God will communicate to you through the Holy Ghost based on what you already know. But God's not going to tell you to go out and stand out in front of 3rd Street and preach the gospel with no clothes on. Well, in Isaiah, he told Isaiah to walk naked and all that. Well, yeah, that's Isaiah, but you're not Isaiah. Your name is Betty Sue and Peggy too, or whatever your name might be. You understand what we're saying? Because see, a lot of these guys like to get scriptures from what those guys did in the Old Testament time and try to do it now when it doesn't apply because those guys didn't have the Holy Ghost. We're in the church of God today. So they want to get handkerchiefs and sell handkerchiefs. And, and if you blow your nose, this handkerchief is going to clear up your sinuses. If you put this hat on, with all this other kind of stuff is not going to work. And people laying around waiting for God to speak to them. They're out in the sun looking for God to talk to them, looking up at the sun. and get looking to get blinded because they're looking at the rays of the sun, talking about they want the Son of God to talk to them. Well, he talks to you when you come to the house of God. And he deals with you through the Holy Ghost concerning things that you are already know. That's why he says, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he should guide you to all truth. And he says, of the comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring back to your remembrance what I have, what? Said unto you. That's how it works. Well, for God to speak to you and tell you, you are the New Testament um, prophet now, and that you going out, that does not happen because he will not deal with us contrary to what he has already said he would do. See, this Bible is everything. It's everything. It's the mind of God. He was the word made what? Flesh. Am I making any sense? All right, so it's for correction. So that's why when we sit down to resolve matters, we take the book because the book is for what? Correction. Correction shows us God's way for instruction in what? In righteousness. Let's read. That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all what? What does that? The scriptures does that. That's what the scripture. So God's not going to tell me to do anything contrary to what he said in here because what is in here is designed to make me perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. So let's go to the fourth chapter, verse 1 through 4. We're almost finished for tonight. Fourth chapter, verse 1 through 4. Let's read. I charge thee therefore before God. Now he has given him a charge. He's given Timothy a charge now. Let's read. And the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living or quick and the dead at his appearing and his what? What's the charge? Verse 2. Preach the word. Now the word was made flesh. And so the word is Jesus. So who are we supposed to be preaching? Jesus. 
Jesus. Is that right? He's preaching my season. Well, if you're talking about the rapture, I can go along with that. You know, um, they want to preach. They want to preach my season. It's my season. Well, it's your season until you overcome. Give me say amen. It's the season to overcome. I tell you what season it is. It's not the season for, uh, well, I just tell you, the season is to repent. Because the church is wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. And the church of God as a whole is to repent. That's the season. But they never talk about repentance, do they? Oh, they don't talk about repentance. Well, anyway... He says, preach the word. Preach the word. Of course, you're preaching Jesus. And if you preach the word of God, the scriptures, you're preaching Jesus. Preach the word. What punctuation is that? That's a semicolon. And when you preach the word, these are the effects that it's going to have. First of all, be instant what? In season what? All right. Whether you feel it's in season or not, you need to preach it. Whether who likes it or not, you need to what? Regardless of who shouts or not, you need to what? You need to preach it. See, some pre preachers, they don't think that they're doing a good job unless people are shouting. And those folk are running around. And that's why when they get to preaching, they don't get the response they want. They want you to praise God. No, we want you to preach the word. Can we say amen? We done already praised him for three hours while we were waiting on you to come out with the word. Now you come out, you want everybody to stand up and, and praise him all that. We, we've been here for three hours waiting on you to come out. Y'all not listening to me. Well, we, it don't happen here. No, it doesn't happen here. But it does happen in some places. You know, you get, you know, the saints are all shouting and having a good time. And they're anxious for the word. And the preacher wants us to praise him. No, it's time for you to preach the word. Quit stalling, trying to get a message from God. You already should have had a message. Get up. Lord, have, listen at me. Preach the word. Can we say amen? All right. Well, preach the word. Be in sin, season, out of season. Let's read. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all what? If you preach the word, it's going to do one or all these things. You know, you can't preach the word and everybody get happy. You're not preaching the word if everybody gets happy. The dope dealer is happy. The prostitute is happy. The alcoholic is happy. You must not have preached the word because if the alcoholic is out there and he's happy, he's supposed to be condemned. Did God bring the alcoholic to church so that he could have a good time? Y'all ain't hearing me tonight. No, oh, there's supposed to be some conviction somewhere. Is that right? If you preach the word, somebody going to grit their tube. <laughs> somebody going to start squirming in their seat. I remember one time I was preaching in Michigan, and I went and walked out the aisle, and the guy was sitting there in the, in the front pew. He's going, <sighs> I said, ooh, the Lion King. I got right back in the pulpit. <laughs> I'm telling you, you preach the word, somebody going to get mad. Somebody ain't going to like it. If you preach the word, give me say Amen. Verse, why is he giving them a charge to preach the word? Verse number three, for the time. Now, you know what? It was will come in that day, but guess what? It has come. For the time will come. It has come. Let's read. When they will not endure what? Word endure means they're not going to put up with it. They're not going to tolerate it. They're not going to sit and listen to it. I'm going somewhere where the real word is being preached. What you think is going on over here? <laughs> Can we <he> say amen? <laughs> you know, well, uh, that's the day that we're living in. You know, they'll come and pray, but they won't come to Bible class, thinking that God is hearing their prayers. It's not, no. The time will come where they will not endure. Can you see that happening right now? Can you see it happening now? They, uh, I'm not putting up with it. I'm not listening to it. I'm not accepting that. I don't believe that. Well, that's because the word is being preached. That's all. For well, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. So they're not going to put up with that. But what else are they going to do? But after their own what? Lust. That means desires. Shall they what? Heap to themselves teachers having what? They're going to go listen to somebody that's going to tell them what they want to hear. 
because everybody in the church is not sheep. Some of them are heifers. <laughs> That's what your Bible says. God called Israel a heifer. You know what a heifer is? <laughs> hey, I'm just telling you what the word says. What a heifer is, you put a chain on a heifer and try to lead a heifer. Wherever you try to take that heifer, he's going to what? He's just not going to act right. The heifer is just going to go over here. You try to take him right. The heifer wants to go left. You try to take him left. The heifer is going to go right. You try to take him forward. The heifer is going to sit down. You try to get the heifer up. The heifer to try to get the heifer to sit down. Heifer's gonna, that's a heifer. That's what Israel was. He said Israel is as a backsliding heifer. Isn't that something? The bishop called them folk heifers. I'm telling you what the Bible said. Some folk, everybody in the church is not sheep. Some of them are goats, just stubborn as they want to be. Is that right? Maybe that's why goat meat is so tough. You ever had goat meat? You got to boil it and bake it, try to soothe gravy on it and all that kind of stuff. Y'all ain't paying me. No, never mind. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's why goat meat is so tough. Praise the Lord. Then you have those that are heifers in the church. No matter what, they don't want to cooperate. They don't agree with anything you do and just don't want to do nothing. They're just spiritual heifers. <laughs> All right. That's, shall, after their own desires, shall they heap to themselves what kind of teachers? Teach, heap to themselves teachers, and they're having the what? Itching ears. They're looking for somebody to satisfy their desires. Tell them what they want to hear. Verse number four, what is the result of that? Verse four, Amen. they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto what? Amen. Fables. This is what he's telling Timothy. It's going to happen, and it is happening right now before our eyes, and we need to acknowledge it. Now, First John chapter 2, we're almost finished. 1 John chapter 2, 1 Epistle of John chapter 2. Who are these people that are like this? Who are they? What are their characteristics? What are their traits? What does the Bible say their traits are? How can we discern their spirit? Well, the, the scriptures. 1 John chapter 2, verse number 19. Why do they fall away and depart from the faith? And why will they not endure sound doctrine? Well, it's for this reason. Let's read verse 19. Let's read. They went out from us. Let's read. But they were not what? Oh, yeah, they left us. They went out from us uh, because in their heart they really were not what? They really weren't of us. Let's read. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have what? Continue with us. Let's read. But they went out that they might be made mad, that it might be revealed that they were not all of us in the first place. Isn't that what the Bible said? Praise the Lord. The Bible is right now. All oh, the scriptures is right. They went out from us, but they were not truly of us. Because if they had been truly of us, they would no doubt have did what? Continue with us. But they went out from us so that it can be revealed that they were not really of us in the first place. You know why? Because they're not God's sheep. They're not God's sheep. Now, I'm not saying that a person can leave the faith and God not bring them back. Can we say Amen. God can bring anyone back, but before he brings them back, they have got to repent, and they can only repent if he grants them repentance. And how can they repent? First of all, they have to be like the prodigal son. They got to come to themselves. And if they never repent, never come to themselves, they can never be saved. Can we say amen? That's what the Bible teaches. Um, let's look at, um, let me look at, let's look at this scripture. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 24 to 26. 
We got about seven minutes. We got enough time. Um, anyone that falls away can come back, but there is a point of no return. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 24. And if they leave the faith and cross the threshold of not being able to come back, then they are lost. But anyone that falls away, if they repent, can be brought back into God's graces. But they have to repent. Well, here's a scripture to let you know what they have to do. All right? Now, again, Paul is talking to Timothy as a pastor. And this is our responsibility to those that have fallen away that want to get themselves straight. Let's read verse 24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive. That's the pastor because there's 18 titles of a pastor in your Bible. And one of them is here is servant. The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be what? Gentle unto all men, apt to teach. And what's the last one? Lord, help us. Patient. Let's read. In meekness instructing those that do what? Those that get themselves in trouble with God, they're not opposing me. They are opposing who? Themselves. And it's our responsibility to in meekness instructing those that do what? Oppose themselves. Why are we to do it in meekness? If God peradventure, which means if God in the event will give them what? Repentance to the acknowledging of what? The truth. What is the truth that they're acknowledging? I was wrong. I was in error. That's why we have to be patient. That's why we are in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves. If God, peradventure, or in the event, or just in case, that's what peradventure means, just in case God would grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth that they were wrong and in error. Let's read on. And that they may recover themselves out of the what? Where are they? They are trapped by who? The devil. That they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his what? At his will. And there are many people that have been taken captive by the devil. If they will only acknowledge the truth. David said, uh, I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever before me. That's why God loved David so much. Because David only repeated the same sin once when he numbered the people twice. Other than that, he never made the same mistake twice. And God loved him. God loved David because David knew how to repent. Can we say amen? A man with all those mistakes. He was a bad father. He, he messed up, caused all kinds of problems, but David knew how to repent. He knew how to get to God's heart. <laughs> Can we say amen? Well, if a person can just get to God's heart when they do wrong, it's like Bishop Clifton Jones says, if a man repents, God will go all out to get him. Go all out to rescue him. But if they're arrogant and proud, he resists the proud, but he gives grace to what? The humble. Let's read on. Oh, well, okay, well, we're finished with that. Taking captive him by his will. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3, verse, uh, Revelation chapter 3. We're going to jump around a little bit. We've got about three minutes. Revelation chapter 3. Again, the scriptures must be fulfilled. Revelation chapter 3. And, of course, we are with the Laodicean church. This is our time. This is our time that we're living in. We are in the era of Laodicea. Laodicea means the rights of the people, what the people want. Isn't that the day that we're living in? Many preachers are preaching what the people want. Churches are doing what uh, the people want. Is that right? Laodicea. Let's read verse 14. We're almost done. We've got one more scripture after this, and we're going to close. Let's read. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of what? Now, these are all descriptions of himself that emphasize 
that this church has great revelation as to who Jesus is. That's our time. All right, verse 15. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou were what? Cold or hot. And Dr. Singer did an excellent job speaking about uh, the history of lukewarm and how the water would come in lukewarm and all those type of things. It was an excellent job. Um, but God says, I know thy works. Thou art neither cold nor hot. You are neither completely all outside of the church, but you're not even hot either. You neither, you, you're kind of, you're in the middle. All right. He says, I would thou were what? Cold or what? Hot. Hot on fire for God. Cold. Uh, completely shut off from God. Because if you're shut off from God, he can save you. If you're hot for God, then you're all right. Let's read verse 16. So then because thou art what? Lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will what? Now spewing does not mean spitting. When you turn on your faucet and the water just flows out, that's spewing. And what he is saying here is that because there are so many folk that are lukewarm in the church, God is just spewing them out. They're spewing. This is the falling away. This is the departing from the faith. Why? Because they're neither, they're indifferent. They're in the middle. They're not all the way for God, but then again, they're not all out either. God hates that. Now, if you were supposed to get something hot and it's lukewarm, how many of you like well, I do know some like this, but how many like warm coffee? Now, my daughter drinks cold coffee. Was some of y'all drink the cold coffee? Well, Jesus did say I would that you were either cold or hot. Can we say amen? <laughs> but warm coffee, warm soup, I can't stand anything. Nine times out of ten, I'm always sending my food back. That's why I pray so hard at the table when I'm in the restaurant. Because some of y'all are scared to send it back. Well, no, that's, that, that's all right. I pray. I said, Lord, watch him. Watch him, Lord. Make sure the camera is on back there to watch him. Watch him, Lord. Oh, yeah, I do that. And the Lord looks out for me. But lukewarm, lukewarm, lukewarm. God said, I will spew you what? And that's what's happening. That's what we're seeing. As fast as they come in, they leave out. They're being spewed out of his mouth. You know why? Because they're lukewarm. Let's read on. Verse 17. Because thou sayest. Now notice God is saying, this is not what I'm saying. This is what you're saying about yourself. Because thou sayest, I am what? Rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. I don't need to go to church. I don't need no pastor. I don't need to pay tithes. I don't need to give offering. I don't need to go to church. I don't need any of that kind of stuff. I'm rich. I'm all right. Let's read. Knowest not that thou art what? Wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and what? Wretched in the sight of God. Of the poorest quality of a saint that could ever be in the sight of God. But they are saying they're rich. But God's saying you're wretched. Then he says you're what? Miserable. Is that right? Miserable, poor, and blind, and what? Naked. Verse I counsel thee to buy me what? Go try it in the fire. In other words, get some faith in my word. Let's read. That thou mayest be rich and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, that the shame of thy what? Nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with thy self, thou mayest see. Uh, verse 19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chase them. Be zealous therefore in what? What's the message for our time? Repent. Verse 20, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and sup with him. And he what? With me. That's all the time we have left there. Let's go to Jude, verse 11, as we close. You can read the rest of that later on. Jude 11. Who are these people? What are their characteristics? What are their traits? Jude 11. This is our last scripture for tonight. And you can read in your spare time. Verses number 11 down to verse 21. All right, let's read. Woe unto them means the judgment of God unto them. For they have gone in the what? Way of Cain is false worship. Cain, uh, instead of bringing God what he required, Cain wanted to do what he wanted to do. He didn't want to do what God wants to do. He wanted to do what he wanted to do. We all know people like that, don't we? 
They want to do what they want to do. You tell them to do this, they're going to do that. You tell them to go here, they're going to go there. You tell them God said this, they tell you God said that. <laughs> well, false worship. Doing what they want to do. You got church standards, they're going to do what they want to do. <laughs> Can we say amen? That's the way of Cain. Let's read. And ran greedily after the what? Era Balaam for reward. Balaam was a prophet for hire. He'd do anything uh, for money. he preach whatever sermon you want. Now keep in mind that uh, God did anoint Balaam to preach a good message to Israel. And do you think that Balaam was saved because God anointed him that one time? No, because when Joshua came along, he killed him. Because God said, cut him off. He's a false prophet. Era Balaam. Let's read. And perished in the what? And he said, Korah. Korah was the one that rose up against Moses and Aaron and said, God talks to us just like he talks to you. Who do you think you are? We, bought, we just as holy as you are. In other words, we know what's best for the church. Who do you think you are? <laughs> and what happened to all these three? God destroyed all of them. Numbers chapter, I'm sorry, I have one more. Numbers chapter 12. God destroyed all of those. And you have people like that today. Numbers chapter 12, verse number one. This is our last scripture. I promise you that. I don't have any others on the, let me give you. Numbers chapter 12, verse number one. All right. And let's read it. Mary and Aaron spake against Moses because of the what? Ethiopian woman whom he had married, for he had married a what? Now that really was not the issue. That was the excuse that they had. This is the issue in verse number two. Let's read. And they said, hath the Lord indeed spoken only by Moses? Hath he not spoken also by us? Is God only talking to Moses? God talks to us too. <laughs> Does God only talk to the pastor? God talks to me too. God told me. Who heard it? And the what? Verse number three. Now the man Moses was very meek above all the men which were upon the what? That means that Moses was always under God's control. Always doing what God told him to do. Always following God's orders. Even though the folk didn't like it, he was still doing what God, what? And I can't imagine how many folk Moses had talking about him. That's why I don't get discouraged about folk talking about me, because Moses had two and a half to four million people. I'm quite sure there was a couple hundred thousand that had something to say about Moses. But he was a meek man. Is that right? Well, upon the face of the earth, verse 4. Let's read. The Lord spake suddenly unto Moses and unto Aaron and unto Miriam, come out ye three unto the tabernacle of the congregation. And they three came out and the Lord came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood in the door of the tabernacle and called Aaron and Miriam. They what? Now God is talking directly to them, but it's not good. It's not good. That's why Jesus said, remember what the Lord your God did unto Miriam. Or it says in the scriptures. Remember what the Lord your God did unto Miriam. Let's read uh, verse 6. And he said, hear now my words. If there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known unto him in a vision and will speak unto him in a dream. My servant Moses, not so, who was faithful in what? All my house. And that's all we're going to stop there. You can read the rest of it. But God smote lip Miriam with leprosy. And Aaron looked at her, and she became leprous. Now, why didn't God punish Aaron? His punishment was mental, because he knew he was just as guilty. And God wouldn't smite him with leprosy, because he was the high priest that would have to declare her clean. And so, what did Moses do? Let's jump down to verse 13. Let's see, this is a pastor here. And Moses cried unto the Lord, saying, Heal her now, oh God, I beseech thee. He's still praying for Miriam. Now, Miriam was a sister. And God says, if her father spit in her face, 
Would she be ashamed for seven days? In other words, let her stay like that for seven days. And the whole church was held up because of Marion's rebellion. And because they were supposed, because as the cloud moved, they were to move. But there could be, the church was at a standstill because of rebellion in the church. Don't let that be you. Fulfill the good part of the scripture. Can we say amen? And get away from those that are fulfilling the bad part. Don't hold their cloaks. Is that right? Did we talk about that the other night? How many of y'all was here we talked about that the other night? Don't hold their cloaks. <laughs> you know, uh, as we close, uh, Bishop Gates was talking about that. He made that point how when, in, uh, how when Stephen was stoned, uh, the Bible says Saul held their cloaks. He held their clothes while they were throwing stones. Now, he didn't throw any stones, but he held the coats of those that threw the stones. And so what is the parallel of that? Some folk are not talking about the pastor, but they are listening to those that are talking about who? Yeah. I was wondering, what are you doing? You're holding their what? Holding their cloak, holding their coat, holding their wig, holding their shoes, holding everything. Just listen at them talk about, well, I didn't say it, but you was there listening. And you received it. That's why your jaws was tight in service. What do they call that? Aiding and a what? See, you ain't got to rob a bank to go to prison. Just be in the car with the robbers. Can we say Amen. I was just trying to get to my cousin's house. Yeah, well, you don't have to worry about your cousin's house no more because you're going to the uncle's state of the Department of Corrections house because you ate it and what? You have some aiders and abettors in church. Are y'all listening to me? You might not be doing what they're doing, but are you aiding? And a betty. Well, a bishop, they said this, but I can't tell you who is it. I can't tell you who said it. Get rid of the cloak. Can we say amen? Stop holding the cloak. <laughs> Stop holding them. You know. All right, let's take off. Any questions tonight? Only questions, no comments. Questions. Yes, sir. No, there is not that today we have this spirit that it may abide with us forever. The only way you can get the Holy Ghost is to repent and uh, have faith in God. And when one receives it, they will speak in other tongues. That spirit of God gives utterance. That is what he did in Old Testament times. Okay, yes. No, you don't necessarily lose it, but you can, um, you can leave it or you can neglect it as if it is not even there, okay? Because he said he'll never leave you, um, but that don't mean that you can't leave him. And uh, the scripture says, grieve not the Holy Spirit. So a person can grieve the Holy Ghost to where it becomes so ineffective it is as if they don't have it at all. Okay. That's what happens to them. So, uh, because he said he may abide with us forever. And therefore, the Holy Ghost then will be a witness against them. Okay. Because they did not surrender to it. It would become so ineffective um, that it would be as though they never even received it. Anybody else? night before we close. All right. Well, thank you for your attention tonight. We're going to uh, prepare to take our offering and uh, be dismissed. Uh, we have to teach like this so that we, we're fighting spirits. Can we say amen?
We're fighting spirits. Oh, someone? Yes, sir. 